And I pray that your word would renew our minds and change our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. But understand this, that in the last days will come and set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. For people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered. Now, I'd like to say that we're only talking about the world out there and that we're not talking at all about the church or any Christians, but I think we know that there are still a few selfish, self-centered Christians hanging around. Amen? I know it's not you. I'm well aware that it's not you, but we just want to pray for all those selfish, self-centered Christians that still need to get a revelation about dying to self and living for God. They're lovers of money aroused by an inordinate, greedy desire for wealth, proud and arrogant, contemptuous boasters, abusive, blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman. You know what that means? They, when people are callous, they can look at needs and not feel at all that they should be the one that tries to do anything about it. Somebody else should always do something, but somehow or another, it's never them. They will admit to no truce or appeasement. They're slanderers, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate, loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce, haters of all that is good. Now, thankfully, this is going to be over in two more verses. Because <laughs> I'll guarantee you this is not a very happy way to start a conference. They will be treacherous, betrayers, rash, and inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. For although they hold a form of piety, true religion, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Now let's just stop right there. For although they hold a form of religion, they deny the power of of that religion. Well, what is the real power of the gospel message? It's the love message. It's the one thing that Jesus said, I'm going to give you as, as a new commandment, one new commandment, love one another just as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. You know, we often think we need somebody to love us, but really what we need is somebody to love. And everybody can find that. There's nobody in the whole world that can't find somebody to love because the whole world is desperate to be loved. Now, you're looking at me kind of like, hmm, wonder where this is going. So let me just tell you something. I wrote a book two, three years ago, I don't know when it was, called The Love Revolution. And um, <laughs> this is the worst selling book I ever wrote. <laughs> I mean, the sales were bad. I mean, really bad. And the most we've ever sold in any conference is 112, they told me tonight. And so when you have, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people in a building, that's just not really very impressive. And you say, well, that must really be a bad book. Why are you telling me about it? <laughs> well, because it didn't not sell because it's bad. It didn't sell because people, frankly, don't think that this is an important message. Or they think they already know all about love. But really, if we did, if we really, if every believer, if everyone who considers themselves to be a follower of Christ was really out in their part of the world walking in love, I would venture to say that most of the world would already be saved. And we absolutely would not have the mess in our society that we have today. And many people today are interested in what the answer is to our dilemma in the world. And from a spiritual standpoint, I believe that the answer to that dilemma is really getting out in society and representing Christ. Not just having a bunch of dead, dry religion, but really having the character of God developed in our life, walking in the fruit of the Spirit which the Bible says there's no law that can come against 
the fruit of the Spirit. You see, when we walk in love, it's, it's impossible for people to really find anything wrong with you. They may try for a period of time, but love will melt the hardest, coldest heart. But it has to be real love. So I'm calling this tonight, what is true love? You know, there's magazines, true love, true romance. So I guess if there's true love, then there must be an untrue love. And if there's true romance, there must be an untrue romance. So the kind of love that is no good is the kind we talk about that has no action to it at all. It's just a conversation. It's just a sermon. But when it comes down to really putting it to work in our daily lives, then we back off from that. So you know what? I'm just mad at the devil. And so I'm just going to preach on love until people either get so tired of hearing me preach on it that they will do it. Because, you know, it really is pitiful how much we talk about love in church and really how little of it there actually is. I mean, you know, we may get together in church and hug each other and say, I love you with the love of the Lord. Oh, I tell you, sister, I just love you to death. I'm like, please don't love me to death. I'm trying to live. Thank you. I tell you, sister, I just love you to death. We just say some of the goofiest things. Well, where were you when I needed a babysitter? Where were you when I needed somebody to help me move? Where were you when somebody else was trying to ruin my reputation and you could have talked up for me and said, no, you're not right about that. Come on. I'm glad that you love me with the love of the Lord, but whatever that is, you know. <laughs> I mean, if we really loved each other with the love of the Lord, the kind of love that Jesus loved with, oh my gosh. I mean, if the church was that loving, you couldn't get all the people in. And I have found out and discovered that the only way that I can walk in love is to do it on purpose. I can't wait to feel like it. I can't wait to want to. I can't wait to think it's fair. And I have to study it, study it, study it, study it. Keep it in front of me all the time because our flesh is inherently selfish and self-centered. And we have to start a war with selfishness and say, I am not going to live a life where I am the only person in it. The Bible says that love is the most excellent thing that we can do. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Now, see, I know a lot of you came tonight thinking, hoping I would solve your problem. Well, I am. This is the answer to all of our problems. Because here's what happens. Let me tell you God's formula for solving problems. You have a problem you cannot help yourself. However, at the same time you cannot help yourself, God will enable you to reach out and help somebody else. Now, when you reach out and help somebody else, you're sowing a seed. Now God can bring a harvest in your life. It used to just aggravate me that I couldn't help myself, but I could help somebody else. And then finally I saw it. That's what God wants us to do. We're not called to in-reach, we're called to outreach. We're not supposed to reach in and fix ourselves or reach in and bless ourselves. We're supposed to do what? Forget yourself, lose sight of yourself, get yourself off your mind and live every day of your life to make somebody else happy, starting at home. Uh-oh, starting at home. Hallelujah. You know, if I, if I drank all my water and said, would somebody here be willing to get me a glass of water? I mean, there would be 500 people bolt for the drinking fountain to bring me a glass of water. You would think that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> oh, I gave Joyce some water. <laughs> but if your husband asked you at home for a glass of water, <laughs> why is it that we're willing to do as a ministry? <laughs> well, <laughs> and let me tell you something. I'm not saying anything to you that God hasn't made me eat. I mean, I didn't go buy a sermon book and get my messages. I've had to live this. And I don't preach anything that I haven't lived and that I don't know for sure works. And I'm telling you, if you want to be happy, forget about yourself and start living to make somebody else happy. Amen? 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but earnestly desire and zealously cultivate 
the greatest and the best gifts and graces, the higher gifts and the choicest graces, and yet I will show you still a more excellent way, one that is better by far and the highest of them all, and that is love. We can see it in Matthew 5, 44. Let's go there. How many of you think you need this? And you've already thought of all the people you wish were here that aren't. Man, I wish my husband would have come with me tonight. Boy, does he need this message. Come on. How many of you have already thought of somebody that you wish was here tonight? See? Well, you know what? I wish they were too, but the thing is, is you're here, and I'm here, so we must need it. Matthew 5, 44 through 47. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you to show that you are the children of your Father who is in heaven. Why does God ask us to do that? To show people that we're not normal like all other people, but we've got something working in us that enables us to do things that are way beyond the ordinary. For he makes his son to rise on the wicked and on the good, and he makes the rain to fall on the upright and the wrongdoers alike. And I love this. For if you love those who love you, what reward can you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brothers, then what more than others are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles, the heathen, do that. So here's my question tonight. Are we able, are we willing to even ask God to teach us how to love the way he loves? Because if we love the way God loves, that means that we're going to love when there's nothing in it for us. Hi, everybody. We're going to love when there's nothing in it for us, when it's just an all giving out. And I can tell you from experience, I know that it will win people to Christ, and it will win some of the hardest people to Christ that you can imagine. I'm sure if you watch my TV program much, you've heard my story about my dad sexually abused me for many, 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 many years. My mother knew what was happening. She just was a very fearful woman who didn't know how to deal with him, and so she just let it happen. And so I was abused and abandoned. Later on, many years later, after I thought that I had totally forgiven, God put it in my heart that as they were getting older that I needed to buy them a better house to live in and take really good care of them until they died. Well, that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do because the first thing that I said to God is, well, what'd they ever do for me? He said, well, you're breathing, aren't you? So the point is, is God wants us to be good to people who haven't done anything for us because that is the best way in the world that you can do spiritual warfare and keep the devil under your feet. Love is the highest form of spiritual warfare. If we think that we're doing something smart to stay mad at somebody and try to get revenge on them, it's the absolute worst thing that we can do for our own selves. It poisons our lives when we do that. And it's all based on feelings. Well, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. Well, I can tell you, I didn't feel like buying my mom and dad a house. And I started out trying to buy a cheap house, and God said, no, you're going to buy a nice house. <laughs> and it's not like we just had a bunch of money laying around to go buy people houses. It was going to take everything that we had. And so I thought, well, surely Dave would tell me no. That was going to be my out. And he looked at me and said, well, if you think it's God, you better obey. And I was like, I don't want to obey. Fast forward the story to the end. Took three years of taking them to the doctors, making sure the bills all got paid, making sure the grass got cut, making sure somebody got their groceries, taking them to the doctor, on and on and on. And finally, one morning, my dad, my mother said, your dad's been crying all week. He wants you to come over, wants to tell you something. All these years, my father had never apologized to me, never even admitted what he did. And on that day, with tears, he said, I'm so sorry for what I did to you when you were a kid. He asked if we would pray with him. He received Christ. We baptized him 10 days later. 
And I always say this, I thought I was buying a house, but actually I was buying a soul. And I don't mean that in a wrong way. We know that Christ paid for our salvation. But you know, sometimes, well, let's put it like this. One of the main reasons why people don't walk in love is because love is an effort. And it will always, now get this, it will always cost you something. If it's real love, it's always going to cost something. It's going to cost some time, some effort, even to not start a fight in your home. It's going to cost you some pride. You're going to have to be willing to swallow your pride and let somebody else think they're right when you're pretty sure you're right, but you don't think it's worth starting a fight over because you know that God has said to keep the peace. Come on now. Oh, this is going to get better as the, as the sessions go by. And it's not that you become a doormat. Love doesn't mean that you just let everybody walk all over you and you let everybody push you around. But here's what it does mean. You confront when God shows you to confront. And you wait on him when he tells you to wait on him. And I've found that when I do it like that, most of the time when God tells me to confront, I just soon leave it alone. And most of the time when I want to confront, he's telling me to leave it alone. When somebody has hurt us, one of the hardest things in the world is to wait and let God bring our vindication. We want to take up for ourselves, don't we? Has anybody gotten anything out of this yet? Now see, if you're waiting for the other person to do what's right, I have an announcement to make tonight. <laughs> you're the one hearing this message, so guess what? You get to start first. And not only that, if you're the Christian in your house, then you ought to be the one to start first. You can't expect people that don't know the word to do anything right. They don't even know what right is. So we have to do it as an example. 